Hey now, welcome to this week's edition of Living Your Hope Live. I'm Joe Olson, and here we are for our second Christmas edition. Hallelujah. 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 This also happens to be the Olson Quarantine Edition because we have COVID in our home and we are in quarantine, or as I like to call it, staycation. We're all doing pretty well, but we do appreciate your prayers. As they say, the show must go on. So, tonight we're going to be having a teaching called A Shepherd's Story. We're also going to have a new edition of KROS News, and later on we're going to have Living Hope Family Church's worship team to do some worship for us. As for now, it's time for Open Line Wednesday. It's Open Line Wednesday, where you can call in live, talk to Joe, and get all your most difficult biblical questions answered. Here's Joe. All right, Frank, here goes nothing, huh? (laughs) As usual. Here we go. Line one. Welcome to Open Line Wednesday. This is Joe. Yeah. Oh, hey, that's a good question. Do Christians use foul language? You know, ideally, I would say no. However, the Bible does say, Job cursed the day he was born. Well, it does. All right, line two. Welcome to Open Line Wednesday. This is Joe. Uh Uh-huh. What happens if you don't pray for seven days? Well, that makes one week. What's that? A couple of personal questions. Okay. Welcome to Open Line Wednesday. This is Joe. Yeah. Am I an organ donor? Well, I I did give my heart to Jesus. Does that count? All right, one more. Hi, welcome to Open Line Wednesday. This is Joe. Uh What is the worst decision I've ever personally made? I think it's doing a thing called Open Line Wednesday. This has been Open Line Wednesday. All right, this week's bump music is my friend Jeremy Gerard. He is a worship leader in Berthoud, Colorado, and uh, an outstanding musician, one of the many I've had the opportunity and privilege to work with over the years. Uh, Just one of the benefits you get when you subscribe to this program. Subscribe. 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 That's great. I want to invite everyone out to Living Hope Family Church. We have services Sunday at 10.30 a.m. We'd love to have you come and join our church family for worship. And we're located at 7333 East 22nd Street. Come on out. We'd love to see you there. Well, we'll not be posting a show next week on the 30th, but we're very excited to announce that we're going to have a New Year's Eve one-hour comedy bash on Thursday, the 31st. We'll be posting that at 7 o'clock. Hope you can be there. Check this out. It's the Living Your Hope Live super special, ultra spectacular, star-studded, life-changing New Year's Eve one-hour comedy bash. Premiering Thursday, December 31st at 7 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook. It's just our little way of saying, 2020, we've had enough of you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for KROS News. Integrity. Class. Experience. Insight. Principle, excellence, caring, perspective, man of the people. This is KROS News with I Cheatham.
Good evening, I'm I Cheatham with KROS News. A person was spotted soaring high above Southern California using a jetpack, again. On Wednesday, for the second time in six weeks, an unidentified person was seen flying using a jetpack near Los Angeles International Airport. It's unclear whether this is the same individual who was recently spotted wearing a jetpack near the same airport. This time around, the jetpack was flying 6,000 feet in the air. China Airlines crew members reported the sighting Wednesday afternoon about seven miles northwest of the airport. The FAA said in a statement, while the military does have experimental prototypes of such flying equipment, none of them are capable of reaching the altitudes that are being sighted here. They said further, it is unclear who could possibly have technology so far ahead of the curve. The FBI is also investigating multiple reports from eyewitnesses from windows of the plane. I'm I Cheatham with KROS News. Stay tuned and reload. This has been KROS News with I Cheatham. I look familiar. Let's open the word tonight. All right, so here's a little riddle for you. What do you do when you're putting together a kid's nativity Christmas play? You've got 15 parts, but you have 30 kids. The answer? More shepherds. The Bible doesn't say if there were three or 30, so you can always add more. You know, the shepherds were not just extras in the nativity story. As a matter of fact, you could call them the New Testament first response unit. They were the first ones to hear of the news of the Christ. They were the first ones on the scene. Their actions actually set an important and a correct response to Jesus's arrival. Last week, we looked at the wise men. Tonight, we're gonna look at the shepherds and the role they played in the nativity story. Tonight, let's take a look at a shepherd's story. Luke chapter two, verses eight through 20. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's begin by looking at first response, because Jesus' entrance into the world demands a response. Christmas is fun to watch because if the world's trying to get along with Jesus, you know, the way you do with certain in-laws. And it's funny because, you know, as long as Jesus is a baby and he doesn't get all sermon on the mountie, they can almost handle him. 
However, the truth of Christianity is, and always has been, that it will demand a response from you and I. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30 says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. While the Spirit of God brings peace to those who know God, there is a polarizing division that the gospel brings into the world. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We see it again and again in the Bible. Think about Joshua and the children of Israel when he says in Joshua chapter 24, choose this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Jesus and the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, this young man comes along and he wants to follow Christ and Jesus says, you know what, you lack one thing, go sell all this stuff that you're dragging along behind you and follow me. And the Bible says that that man left in sorrow. It, Jesus brought him to a decision. There's Jesus and the disciples, 5,000 people get up and make a mass exodus in John chapter 6. And Jesus turns to the 12 and says, are you going to go away also? Because the gospel always brings us to a decision. You can look at the Jews when Jesus was being tried and they chose Barabbas rather than Jesus. There's always a choice. You know what cracks me up? Atheist fish bumper stickers. Now, come on, really? Kind of ridiculous. I don't believe that Mickey Mouse is real, but I don't put a bumper sticker on my car and get into arguments with people over it. It's true. People have to make a choice when Jesus Christ is involved. The powerful thing about these shepherds is the great standard and example they set in making a choice to be the first ones to respond at Jesus' arrival. We're going to take a walk through this text, kind of an expositional verse by verse, and have a look at it tonight. Verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Let me ask you a question. When you have earth-shattering important news, who do you call first? When you're going to announce that God has arrived to earth in physical form, these shepherds seem like an odd choice, don't they? They're not a king or a priest or a national leader. It's not even Oprah. Shepherds were generally looked down on in the religious community. They lived out in the fields. They weren't able to be ceremonially clean all the time. And yet these were the ones that God chose to share his good news with first. They were the everyday common working man. There was a European monarch that worried his court by often disappearing and walking incognito amongst his people. When he was asked not to do so for security's sake, he answered, I cannot rule my people unless I know how they live. Jesus didn't come to visit the common man. He actually became one. He, did, he came for all people, not just those of rank and privilege. When we pray for revival, we're praying for a visitation of the Spirit of God to invade all that's common. And this was a physical visitation, the ultimate revival. Verse 9, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. We also need to note that whenever Jesus walks in the room, it's a confrontation between light and dark. John chapter 3 verses 20 through 21. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Here are these shepherds. They're out in the middle of a field in the dark. There's no street lights. Can you imagine how terrifying it would be to suddenly have that entire area light up with angels? I remember when I heard the gospel, it was like the lights went on in my soul. It was terrifying. You know, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per hour. <laughs> when the light of God hits your soul, the speed of that is incalculable. I read of the crash of an Eastern Airlines jumbo jet in the Florida Everglades. The plane was the now famous Flight 401, bound for Miami from New York City with a heavy load of holiday passengers. As the huge aircraft approached Miami Airport for its landing, a light that indicates proper deployment of the landing gear failed to come on. 
The plane flew in a large, looping circle over the swamps of the Everglades while the cockpit crew checked out the light failure. Their question was this, had the landing gear actually not deployed, or was it just the light bulb that was defective? To begin with, the flight engineer fiddled with the bulb. He tried to remove it, but it wouldn't budge. Another member of the crew became curious and tried to help him out. Then another. And by and by, if you can believe it, all eyes were on the little light bulb that refused to be dislodged from its socket. No one noticed that the plane was losing altitude. Finally, it flew right into the swamp. Many were killed in that plane crash. What's the moral of that story? Don't argue with the light. Verses 10 through 11. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I think it's funny how many people say they would like to have an angel appear to them. I think it would be the most terrifying thing in the world. The first thing they have to say to these guys is, hey, don't be afraid. We're here to bring you some good news. And that's the thing, man. God takes the time to minister to us, even when he's trying to reach us. It says this is good news to all people, all generations, every race, age, gender, financial status, vocation. No one's left out. And that's important in a day like today when not all good news is good news. A pilot said to the passengers on a commuter flight, I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that we're lost, but the good news is that we've got a strong tailwind. Jesus' arrival was the best news ever, the best thing that has ever happened to humanity in all of history. The Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, God come in the flesh. Verse 12, And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. When I prayed to get saved, one of the things I told God was, you know what, I want to know you. I don't just want to know about you. And he met me in that place and became undeniable in my life. Now, when it comes to knowing God, my experience is not enough for you. You must have your own. See, God's not afraid of that challenge. He desires to know you and to make himself real to you again and again and more and more. That's why he said to these shepherds, this will be a sign to you. One of the greatest thrills of a relationship with God is to see all the ways that he works in our life and in our circumstances. Those become signs in our lives. Well, I've heard the argument, those Christians, they act like every coincidence is God. But isn't it odd how the more you know God, the more coincidences seem to happen? You can know God for yourself tonight. He's not afraid to prove himself to us. We just need to come to him on his terms. Repentance. Verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Before Christ came, with just a few exceptions, men knew of God. After Jesus' death, we can know him. In the Old Testament, even God's own people were generally afraid of him. The Jewish word for God is Jehovah, but the Jews rarely spoke that word out loud out of fear and reverence. Through Jesus Christ and his death, we're now invited into a completely different relationship with God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now that doesn't mean that we come to God without a sense of reverence. A.W. Tozer said, The fear of God is astonished reverence. I believe that the reverential fear of God mixed with love and fascination and astonishment and admiration and devotion is the most enjoyable state and the most satisfying emotion the human soul can know. Declared to these shepherds was on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Here is God declaring his intention for these men and for you and I in a tangible gift. It's an invitation for you and I to know him personally. Verses 15 and 16. So it was, when the angel had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. 
Isn't it amazing how that moment, that night, when the angels appeared, the priorities of these shepherds changed. Suddenly, just sitting there with the sheep wasn't enough. They had to do something else. A couple in Atlanta read that My Fair Lady was still playing on Broadway in New York City. They wanted to go so badly, so they bought their tickets months ahead of time and planned their vacation. The long-awaited day came, and they flew to New York City. They presented their tickets, walked in, and sat down in wonderful seats, seven rows from the front near the orchestra. To the man's amazement, the entire place filled up except the seat right next to him. He was curious about that. At the intermission, he leaned over in conversation with the lady in the second seat away from him and commented how they had to wait so many months to get tickets to a performance. When there was such a demand for seats, why would someone not come? Did she have any idea? She said, yes, as a matter of fact, these two seats are mine, this one and that one. She explained further, you see, that seat belonged to my husband and he died. The man said, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but couldn't you have invited a friend to come with you? She said, no, they're all at the funeral home right now. These shepherds' lives have suddenly taken on a whole new set of priorities. They're like, let's go, make haste. Suddenly, there's nothing more important to these shepherds than the news that they've been given. Discovering salvation and a relationship with God sets everything back into the correct order in our lives. I've noticed that many times when people's priorities get off track, their relationship with God is suffering at that time. I like the way these guys spurred each other on. Come on, let's go. We really do need brothers and sisters to help us serve God. Verses 17 and 18. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. It says there, when they had seen him. Once God becomes personally genuine to us, we are not going to be able to keep this to ourselves. <laughs> when I got saved, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I did a complete turnaround from being antisocial, more likely to cuss at you than to talk to you, to suddenly I'm the guy telling, trying to tell everyone about Jesus Christ. It says they made it widely known. They're talking to anyone who would listen to him. They are changed by this experience, and the natural reaction was to tell others about it. It also says there, all who heard it marveled, probably not only at what they had to say, but at the transformation they're seeing there that had resulted in these common shepherds. The gospel means good news. It's too good to keep for ourselves. Verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. If you think about all Mary and Joseph had just gone through, they were probably discouraged. I mean, if, you know, God is for us, why can't we even find a hotel room, right? I'm Tom Bodette from Hotel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. That's probably what they were thinking, and what a powerful confirmation it must have been to them to have these shepherds show up and begin to report all that they had seen and heard. I can tell you that for pastors, there's few things that bring greater joy to their heart than to hear about the things that God is doing in the lives of people in the church. It ministers to the ministers. 3 John chapter 1, verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. The Bible tells us there that Mary kept those things and pondered them. She had those things, she no doubt pulled them out from time to time because they had become a reference point for her faith. Verse 20, Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. It says there that the shepherds returned. They went back to their world. They went back to their life. But they went back changed and different. Now they're praising God. They have a whole new language. They have a whole new perspective on who they are. They're like, God chose us out of everyone in the world. They have a whole new purpose in their lives. It says they're glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. It's thought due to the particular location of these flocks that it indicates that these shepherds were actually in the employ of the temple to produce perfect, unspotted, unblemished lambs for sacrificing in the temple. Now these men had gone and they had seen the perfect, unblemished Son of God who was going to become the sacrifice for all sin, for all men in the world. And once they seen that all that they had heard was true, it says they had reason to rejoice and be changed. 
We've heard the Christmas story once a year for our entire lives. If we'll accept Christ, we'll know that everything we've heard in this account tonight is true and it'll change us as well. I like the shepherds. They were the first response unit to the coming of Christ and they gave us a great example and a pattern of a right response to Jesus' entrance into this world. They were regular people. They had to choose to be in and to hear the light. It's good news. God has good intentions and wants to know us. He's willing to prove himself, to get personal with you and I. It transforms our priorities when we encounter the living God and the good news is too good to keep for ourselves. Our testimony encourages those around us and God sets us back in our world, but we are different people. You want 2020 to be a better year? I have some good news. God has a gift for you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never experienced a personal relationship with God, I'm not just talking about embracing a religion or putting on some sort of a religious title on your life. I'm talking about you knowing the God who created you. If we'll come to God on his terms tonight, if we confess that we're sinners, if we ask him to forgive us, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can know the God who created us. I'm going to say a simple prayer tonight. If you'll agree with me as I pray this prayer, I believe God will honor that. Lord, we thank you for coming to this earth. We thank you for laying down your life and paying for the sin that's in our lives. God, we do confess our sin. We ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would come into our heart and into our life. God, we want to know you. We don't want to just know about you. We want to know you from this day forward. And I thank you, God, for every life you're going to transform in the name of Jesus. My friends, rejoice unto you. Christ is given. Now tonight we have the Living Hope Family Church worship team. This is called Worthy of It All.
Hey, well, I'm so glad you joined me. Merry Christmas to you and your family. I'll see you next week for the New Year's Eve bash. The Lord bless you tonight. Live in your hope this week. Hey, Frank, didn't that guy look a little like Donald Trump? Yeah, yeah, kind of did. I tell you, that guy's having the time of his <laughs> life. That's the only way to fly. Well, let me ask you this. Does he really need those frequent flyer miles? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said it right before the newscast. The F by the F by B. The fib also. The F by the F Y I F E B F I think it by the F. Hey now.